Right, so the part of the chapter I want to focus on is there in Romans chapter 13, verse 4. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. This is a New Testament verse which clearly indicates what that evildoers ought to be put to death. Yeah? In an ideal society, the New Testament supports the death penalty. Okay? Now, it says, uh, For he beareth not the sword in vain. Who bears the sword? It's the executioner. Right? The one who executes, the one who puts someone to death. What does he does with the sword? What does he do with the sword? Put someone to death. I mean, that's the correct use of it for a new evildoer. The right use of the sword would be to put them to death. Right? Now, of course, in uh, the United Kingdom, they use this word sometimes to knight people. Yeah? Knight them. I knight thee, sir, whatever. And uh, of course, here it's, it's talking about an evildoer. You don't knight an evildoer. But unfortunately, that's not the case today in England, right? They're knight evildoers. Sir Elton John, Sir Ian McKellen, all these reprobates. You know, that's not the correct use of the sword. That's not putting the sword to the right use, you know? I mean, what's the right way to use a sword? Yeah, how do you knight an evildoer, you know? I, I, would, I would explain, and tack! You know, that's the right way to do it. Yeah. See, the title of the sermon today I'm going to preach is Arguments Against Death Penalty Debunked. Arguments Against Death Penalty Debunked. There are so-called biblical arguments today, which Christians use. They use verses from the Bible and they say death penalty should not be practiced today. We should stand, stand against the death penalty. And not only from the Christians, of course, we also have uh, worldly arguments, which the atheists, the vegans, and all these idiots use, uh, saying we shouldn't put anyone to death. But this sermon, I will purely focus on the biblical arguments that Christians use. Okay? Normally, as NIFB Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, King James only soul winners, whenever we come across situations, maybe with friends, family, when you're talking about these issues I and mean, when you quote the Old Testament, hey, these people should be put to death. That's what God wants. We are often smeared as blood mongering or death craving radicals. Oh, you, you want death? You're pro death? You know, just because we quote the Bible, just because we quote the Old Testament. Yeah. Now, the number one argument right off the bat, this is what I've seen in most cases. People say, oh, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Yeah. People who use this argument is number one, they lack common sense. Okay, they don't understand the difference between murdering someone and putting someone to death, legally putting someone to death. Yeah. And the second group of people I have seen who use this argument are reprobates. Reprobates, homos. Whenever you condemn the homos, whenever you say what the Bible says, they say, hey, doesn't the Bible say thou shalt not kill? And even when uh, Brother Anselm uh, came, came with the sermon, Where is Uniga Nation? They wrote an article. Yeah, these reprobates wrote an article and they said he's calling for the murder of homos. And that is not what he did. That is not the truth. He said, hey, that's not up to us. We shouldn't be doing that. That should legally come from the government. If you were to live in a righteous nation, this would be the law. He didn't call for murder. We are not calling for murder. We are not taking the law into our own hands and saying we need to go with violence and stab these people. That's not what we are saying. We are not Muslims. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, one of the reasons why a lot of people connect the death penalty to murder is because of wrong dictators, these evil dictators that existed in Europe in the past decades like Hitler or Stalin, they were dictators and they took, they took the freedom to kill people when they did not agree with them. Stalin especially killed millions of people yeah? who, who, who stood up against him, who didn't agree with him, he just killed them. And, uh, and of course, in one way, that's like a death penalty. You know, he's a, he can make the laws, he can write the laws. 
and people have looked to those kind of uh, evil dictators and said oh you know see what death penalty is wrong no the person is wrong you know you don't take away god's laws because of somebody who abused it yeah they resort to nazi germany or soviet communism genocides see you don't overthrow the system because of people who abuse the system that's not how it works okay you don't abolish god's law because of people's failure yeah genesis chapter 9 verse 6 you don't have to turn there i will read it genesis chapter 9 verse 6 whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed for in the image of god made he man this is the first time we see in the bible where god is instituting the death penalty before that he did not institute the death penalty okay and the world was filled with violence and god had to destroy the world now a lot of people say oh well, didn't god know any better I mean, why did he came up later? Oh, I made a mistake. I should have instituted the death penalty before. No. See, God did not institute the death penalty before because he works not according to our standards. Okay. He works in such a way that future generations understand why God did the way he did. You know, that's how, that's how God paints the world. You know, see, for example, um, he, he had a particular way of uh, um, in the Old Testament, he chose a nation in a geographical location who would be a light unto the world, right? And um, <clears throat> and in the New Testament, it's a picture of uh, believers, believers who are called out, uh, who are set apart. You know, that's the picture he uses. God wants us to understand the need for death penalty today because of all the violence people created because of which he had to destroy the world. You know, he shows us a part of history, the, uh, how it happened, how evil the world was. And today we look at that and says, yeah, it makes sense for us to have the death penalty. You know, that's how God teaches us lessons. Yeah. And very important in Genesis chapter nine, it says, whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. It is man's responsibility. Death penalty should be carried out by man. It is not God who does it. Okay, when Cain killed Abel, did God, God kill Cain? Cain, it's not his job, right? See, God will kill people for reasons best known to him. For example, he killed sons of Judah. He killed Ea, he killed Onan for uh, uh, being evil. They didn't commit actually sins that were, according to the law, punishable by death. For example, God killed Utsa, who just held the ark with his hands, right? And in New Testament, he killed Ananias and Sapphira, who lied. They didn't really commit a capital crime, but God did kill them because, you know, that's not a capital crime. And God saw the fit that they should be killed so that the fear of God would fall upon other people. Yeah. Now, I just want to give a brief about all the punishments for which the death penalty is applied to. OK, there are about more than 600 laws in the Old Testament, 623 laws. And about I and I counted up to 30 laws. There are 30 laws for which the death penalty is applied for. Okay, so I, this, this will be interesting. Let's look at it. Let's number one. I'll go in the uh, uh, order of appearance in the Bible. Okay, I won't give uh, verses for each. I don't have that much time. Number one, murder. Number two, kidnap. Number three. A child who curses his father or mother. Number four, someone who intentionally smites a pregnant woman, causing a miscarriage. Amen. Abortion doctors, yeah. You planned it, yeah, exactly. Number five, a man whose ox kills someone after previously goring other people. Okay. This animal was known to be violent, but the owner did not put it to death and it went and killed somebody else. The owner has to be put to death. Number six, a witch. Amen. Number seven, someone who lies with an animal, bestiality, both the person and the animal be put to death. Number eight, sacrificing to another God. Idolatry is punishable by death. Number nine, working on the Sabbath. 
you're not taking a holiday on the Sabbath, you go to work, put to death. Number 10, child sacrifice. Offering your child to Molech is punishable by death. Number 11, anyone who smites his father or mother. Number 12, adultery. 13, a man who lies with his stepmother, both of them should be put to death. Number 14, a man who lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them should be put to death. Number 15, Kanka Fleka. Yeah. <laughs> it's a homo, a fag. Yeah. Number 16. A man who takes a wife and her mother. And the Bible says, you know the punishment? All three of them should be burnt. That's what the Bible says. Leviticus 20. I mean, I, I, don't, I can't imagine that somebody who's, who takes his wife and also his mother. It's, what kind of a evil threesome is that? And of course, in Leviticus 20, it says witch and also the word wizard is used. Also, a wizard should be put to death. Okay, it's not just female witches. It's also male wizards. Number 17, one who blasphemes the name of the Lord. Number 18, a non-Levite who tries to set up or take down the tabernacle. Somebody who's not a Levite, who's putting up a tabernacle or taking it down, put to death. So if you're not an ordained pastor and you're starting a church or you're trying to take it down, I mean, that's the parallel I draw. You know? Number 19, a false prophet. Yeah, Lothar Gassman, put to death. Number 20, a family member or a close friend who entices you to worship other gods. 21, sons of Belial in any city who entice the inhabitants of that city to worship other gods. They be put to death. Number 22, one who does not hearken to the decision made by a judge. He doesn't accept the decision made by a judge. Put to death. 23, a false witness whose testimony leads to the death of an innocent person. That's almost as murder, yeah? Number 24, a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his parents even after chastisement. He's chastised by his parents. He does not obey. They take him to the judges. The judges will decide and they'll stone him to death. 25, a woman who gets married by lying about her virginity when she is not one. She played the whore in her father's house and she got married. And the husband finds out that she's not a virgin, she'll be put to death. 26. Premarital sex involving a betrothed woman, an engaged woman. Okay? Both will be killed. It's, it's adultery again. Number 27. The man who rapes a woman, a rapist. Okay, that's 27. Now, the thing is, the next three of them. It is not clear whether the Bible is saying that they should be put to death or not because the Bible uses the term to be cut off. That people who do this shall be cut off. Now, I believe that it is more of a relative decision. Like, for example, this is what I think. For example, if you're a Jew, if you're an Israelite, sorry, not a Jew, Israelite who has his heritage in the tribes of Israel and you know all the laws, like, for example, eating blood, okay? Eating blood is forbidden. You shouldn't eat blood. So if an Israelite eats blood, he be put to death. Okay? But if somebody is a foreigner who just got into the land, he's a newcomer. Okay? He, he, he said, I will become an Israelite. And then if he drinks blood, maybe I'm thinking the judges would say, okay, well, we'll just excommunicate you. Go find, live in another land. You're no longer an Israelite. That could be another interpretation of to be cut off. So under this to be cut off, there are three Number 28 is not circumcising, lack of circumcision, put to death or cut off. 29, eating blood. 30th, not observing the Passover, not observing the Passover, put to death or cut off. Now we have seen 30 laws for which the death penalty is applied for. God instituted the death penalty. Amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> yeah. You know, see... The world will try to argue like this. This is one of the arguments the world brings. It says, 
death penalty does not really help you correct yourself. I mean, we want people to have a second chance in life. If you apply death penalty, where will they have the opportunity to correct themselves? Well, you need to understand that God instituted death penalty for different reasons. For example, most of these uh, punishments, most of, most of these crimes are reprobate, are committed by reprobates. And when you read the Bible, when you understand the reprobate doctrine, these people cannot correct themselves. Okay? And God wants these people, these vile people, to be put to death so that the world is not filled with violence, so that children won't be molested. Innocence won't be hurt. Yeah. And not only that, that's one of the reasons why he put uh, death penalty. For example, working on the Sabbath day. If somebody is working on the, he's not a reprobate. But God said this person should be put to death in the Old Testament. Why? Because God cares for the sanctity of his salvation. Working on the Sabbath pictures working for your salvation. And that takes you to hell. And God puts a death penalty that pictures that. And obviously in the New Testament, that has been lifted off, particularly. And a lot of people debate about this. This isn't a huge issue. It's adultery. Why did God put death penalty for adultery? Okay, number one reason is, of course, marriage is also a picture of salvation. You know, it's a relationship between Christ and the ch local church. That's what marriage is. And when somebody is breaking that marriage, you're breaking, you're actually attacking the gospel in a way. You know, to maintain the sanctity of his salvation, God has instituted death penalty for adultery. That's number one. And number two, I believe, if you commit adultery as a married man, you've not only destroyed your life, but you've also messed up the life of your spouse. Yeah. And God wants your spouse to have another chance in life and not end up with you. You know, and if you be put to death, she can marry someone else. No, there's a lot of women who say, oh, it's okay if my husband commits adultery. You know, I'll forgive him as long as he comes back to me. It's okay. Yeah, I know it's not a good thing. But the thing is, God knows what's better for you. You know, most of the adultery cases, it only gets worse and worse and worse. It's never getting better for the spouse. Yeah. Now, another worldly argument, which I've heard mostly from Europeans, is that you know, look at all these countries like India, USA, they have the death penalty. And look at all the violence in their countries. There are more people being put, more crimes and more people are dying. But in Europe, it's very safe. There is no death penalty in European countries and you don't have all these murder, murders and all these things. Now, is it really true though? How many abortions happen? Isn't that murder? There are so many murders that happen, of course. And what about all the homophiles? What about all the pedophilia? Europe is one of the hub for pedophiles. Huge. So, you know, there's so many. Murder is not the only sin for which death penalty is applied first. There are so many other sins and they are blatantly happening here in Europe. Yeah? It's getting more and more wicked. See, we are enjoying peace and prosperity in this country because of our forefathers you know there was a time when the christianity prevailed in this land may not be there may not have been the right gospel everywhere but people had christian standards of living and god blessed this land of course i don't see that as a future yeah <laughs> argument number two we already saw argument number one people say thou shalt not kill argument number two this is what people say they say the death of jesus abolished death penalty they said, hey, Jesus died, so no one has to die. You know, it's a, it's a mix of words. They play around with words. Receiving the death penalty is not the same as going to hell. That's what they're confused with. They think going to hell is putting someone to death is going to hell. No. Even a saved person can commit adultery, could have committed adultery in the Old Testament, be put to death, and he went to heaven. See, the death of Jesus, if that's the case, if that it's, that's their argument, the death of Jesus should have abolished every penalty. Right? Today, for example, people say today we shouldn't have the death penalty because Jesus died. Okay, then why not lift every other penalty? You know, don't, no fines, you know, no, no criminal justice, nothing. Doesn't work. See, the thing is we all deserve death in hellfire. 
we all deserve that that is a penalty we all deserve but you know we all don't deserve the death penalty in this life for our physical body most of us we haven't committed crimes deserving death right see let me tell you even a lot of reprobates today don't deserve to die because they haven't committed that offense yet or they haven't been caught or they don't have the evidence yet you know without evidence you can't judge yeah like physically speaking in this world see there is a difference between god's civil laws civil laws and god's moral laws see ceremonial laws you know what ceremonial laws right there were some laws that were temporary in the old testament but they were specifically lifted off let's turn to hebrews chapter 9 turn your bibles to hebrews chapter 9 and while you are turning there I will read from Colossians chapter 2 verse 16 and 17 Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come but the body is of Christ The Bible is clearly say, saying that all these ceremonial things meat drink holy day sabbaths new moon they were only a shadow of things to come Okay and if you turn to Hebrews 9 if you are there I will start reading from verse 6 Hebrews chapter 9 verse 6 Now when these things were thus ordained the priests went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God but into the second went the high priest alone once every year not without blood which he offered for himself and for the errors of people the holy ghost the signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tab tabernacle was yet standing which was a figure for the time of then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience look at verse 10 which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation until jesus came but christ being come on high hyper uh, sorry but christ being come on come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say not of this building verse 12 neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us i mean the bible clearly says all these ceremonial ordinances have been lifted up okay we no longer have to follow them because jesus fulfilled all of that all of those things have been fulfilled in jesus no more uh, sacrifices no more sabbath no more feasts holy days all punct fiatis okay so people are basically confusing a lot of people who use to say even the death penalty is part of the uh, the old uh, old covenant which is not now argument number 3 okay we've saw i've seen argument number 1 thou, thou shalt not kill argument number 2 they say the, the the death of jesus abolished death penalty and argument number 3 and i i want to divide this argument in three parts 3a 3b 3c because they're usually flowing from one argument to the other these are commonly these are they are they are packed together so this is argument 3a okay this is what people believe this is what people argue they say the death penalty was instituted only to show the seriousness of sin okay they say the death penalty was instituted to show that god hates sin that god despises sin he finds sin so horrible that he instituted death penalty for the sins but in the new testament it's the death of jesus that shows how horrible sin is Okay? You you don't have to look to the law to understand how God hates sin. The sin is so detestable. You just have to look at the cross. You just have to look at Jesus, his wounds and his sacrifice and then you will know that sin is horrible. That God hates sin. It kind of sounds a little bit smart but it isn't. Okay? If if God wanted to show the seriousness of sin in the Old Testament, if he wanted to show Okay that he hates sin and that's why he put death penalty he should have put death penalty for all sins 
Why did he put death penalty for only these few 30 sins? He should have put death penalty for even for stealing, even for lying, for every simple thing. But we don't see that. See, the death penalty is not a foreshadowing of Jesus' sacrifice. What is the foreshadowing of Jesus' sacrifice? It is the animal sacrifices. It is the Sabbath. These things are a foreshadow of Jesus' sacrifice and they have been particularly lifted up in the New Testament. Okay, and the New Testament, we just read Romans 13 in the beginning, where it says, He that bears the sword does not do it in vain. Yeah. See, does everyone deserve the death penalty? No. <clears throat> and this is what they're saying, you know, when you say this, this is argument, I'll repeat it. They say, hey, the death penalty was instituted, it was only symbolic, it wasn't meant to be practiced. They say, it was only there to show the horrid nature of sin. And then uh, when you ask them, but, but the death penalty is not applied for all sins, man. Are you saying that uh, we, we, everybody should be put to death because we are all sinners? You know what they say? They say, well, Jesus said looking at a woman lustfully is adultery. Okay, I, I didn't get the connection. I didn't get the transition. If you ask them, should, 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 we all of, should all of us be put to death? Because we're all sinners. They said, well, Jesus said, looking at a woman lustful is adultery. What do they mean by that? They're actually meaning that we all deserve the death penalty. We all deserve to die. They're again getting confused between death penalty and eternal death. Death in hellfire. See, the thing is, in the Old Testament... Were be people being put to death for looking at a woman lustfully? No. People were actually being, being put to death. The law was against those who actually commit the act of adultery, not for just looking at somebody with a lustful eye. And they'll argue away saying that, well, yeah, it was only symbolic. You know, God is a God of second chances. You know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, I will read from Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and 28. You don't have to turn there. This is what Jesus is saying. This is what they misquote. Ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Okay, now this confuses a lot of people. I mean, is, is Jesus equating looking at a woman lustfully as adultery? Some people come up with this argument saying, Jesus raised the bar. Jesus set the standard of the law on a higher pedestal. Have you ever heard this argument? Yeah. I've heard that my whole life. Now, I was thinking, doesn't the Bible say the law of the Lord is perfect? How can Jesus make some, something more perfect when it is already perfect? I don't get that. I'll give an example to explain this, okay? Back when I was in uh, India, in the church where I was going, there was this young guy who was like 20 years old and he started to have a girlfriend. He was dating somebody from his class and he started put, uh, putting, uh, posting weird pictures on Facebook, you know, like hugging, cuddling, you know, like what couples take, yeah? And so one of my elders asked him, Hey, buddy, what are you doing, man? Are you, are you in a physical relationship? Are you fornicating? He was like, Yain. Like, like yes and no. Yeah. What do you mean? We are not doing what you think we are doing. We are not doing that. Which means he's doing everything else. Yeah? And that's bad as well. You know, I've, I've known couples in Germany, Christian couples who are dating, who are living together, who are in a fornicating relationship. But sometimes they say, well, we're, we're not doing the final part. We are saving it for marriage. You know, there are women I know who, who are doing all kinds of things, but they, but they still virgin, they still maintain that virginity. But you know what, once they get married, they will have the same consequences. You know, it's the same thing. There isn't much of a difference. You know, that's what the Pharisees were probably doing. They were saying, well, you know, 
if you are sleeping with someone it doesn't count as adultery only if you are married to somebody else apart from your wife then it counts as adultery you know if you're sleeping with someone for one hour it doesn't count as adultery if you're only living with them then it counts as adultery you know that's what i think the pharisees come up with all kinds of stupid laws and jesus is finally putting that to rest he's saying hey even if you look at a woman lustfully you've committed adultery with her in your heart does that make sense you know jesus isn't coming up with some new doctrine here job job says in job chapter 31 verse 1 you don't have to turn there he says i made a covenant with my eyes why then should i look uh, think upon a maid yeah job is saying he made a covenant with his eyes not to look at a woman with lust you know this is also old testament jesus is basically quoting the old testament he isn't, isn't coming up with something new and raising the bar or something you know these pharisees were distorting the laws they were defining what counts as adultery what doesn't count as adultery and jesus basically says hey even if you're having a wrong lustful eye towards women you're already at wrong there you're already sinning there okay it is not the same as committing adultery okay if if that's the case we all should we all deserve to be put to death then yeah we all deserve the death penalty but that's not the case an argument number 3c okay the third one they say um, it was only symbolic in the old testament and next they say well um jesus uh, said even putting it uh, looking at somebody with a lustful eye is adultery and this is the next argument once you explain this they automatically uh, automatically get, get into the next argument they say the law was already abolished long before in the old testament they say the death penalty was lifted up long before they said they say once israel became a nation the death penalty was lifted up when israel was in wilderness when they were in the camp they were in a state of war they they were uh, given the task to topple all this the existing nations occupy their lands so they needed to be in that military kind of discipline and god imposed on them the strict laws and once they became a nation uh, it was all relaxed it was all amended and this is this is how they justify the argument they say king david wasn't put to death for his sin and that's why that is a proof that the death penalty wasn't being practiced okay which means that a lot of other people also were probably not being put to death for committing adultery it shows that the, the death penalty was lifted up already before now this puts a lot of christians in confusion yeah I don't know if you've thought about this. I I struggled with this question. Why wasn't King David put to death? He committed sin. Don't you think he committed sins worthy of death? Capital crimes, right? Adultery, murder. He of course he didn't directly commit murder. It was like he hired a hitman to do it. Yeah. <clears throat> See, when God called Israel out of Egypt, and when he was training them to be a nation he of course is al already referring to them as a nation even while they were in the camp and what was the government that god originally intended for israel judges that was his will judges he would raise judges and if and judges are not about the law yeah if a judge goes rogue if a judge goes corrupt he would be judged by another judge yeah that's a system of judges and in 1st Samuel chapter 8 you don't have to turn there I'll just give you a gist the people they don't like the judges anymore yeah they're like some of the judges are failing you know all the other kings have kingdoms and kings they go to Samuel and say you want a king and God tells Samuel he wants them he say hey if you have a king he's going to exploit you he's going to do all these things he gives a list and you won't you will cry out you won't be happy with him and when you cry out I will not listen to your prayer I'm, I'm warning you already and and uh, they say no no we we want a king anyways and god is like working with them is okay, okay let's let's you know let's see how it works and he's working with them basically what is he saying that if you have a king he's going to be above the law yeah you cannot apply the death penalty or most of the law upon a king yeah and that's why king david when he committed adultery was he put to death no i mean who would put him to death He's got an army. He's got palace guard. Who would come with a stone? 
it's, it's, it's not practical. See, even when Nathan comes to King David, he's very careful in how he approaches. Hey, you, he doesn't say that. He's giving him a story. He tells, oh, there's this guy who has many sheep and he takes the sheep of this poor guy for his friends and he kills it. And he's trying to make the king give the judgment himself. He's very careful how to address the king. But you know, I believe that King David should have been put to death. Should have been put to death. Because, did you look at how King David's life ended up after that? One tragedy after the other. His firstborn died. One of his son uh, seduces his stepsister. He gets killed by Absalom. Absalom almost takes the kingdom away from David. He, he ends up getting killed. I mean, how much tragedy did King David face? Sometimes I look at him as a man. It would have been better if he had been put to death. That is another reason why God put adultery, um, death penalty for adultery. No? Because he knows, oh man, you screwed up your life. You better come home. You know, and this is a lesson for us. If you as a married man, even if you're single tomorrow when you get married, don't contemplate adultery. Because if you commit adultery the, as a child of God, the consequences will be so great that you will wish that there was a death penalty. Now we must be sitting here and saying, okay, Moses, I committed certain sins. I know I deserve to die. But the German government doesn't put me to death. So why not contemplate suicide? Why shouldn't I kill myself then? Number one, that's not up to you. God didn't <laughs> put suicide as a death penalty. If by another man, you should be killed, not by yourself. And let me tell you, oh, what difference does it make? I'm Christian. If I die or not, I'm going to heaven. So I might just kill myself. See, let me tell you, if you commit suicide, Sure, if you're a believer, you'll go to heaven, yeah. But you'll regret the moment you get there. You will suffer loss. The Bible says there will be Christians who go to heaven and suffer loss. Because when you go to heaven, you will know, you'll get a picture of what, how big eternity is. And then you'll realize that how small your life on earth was. And you'll feel stupid that you cut it even shorter. Man, I could have just calmed down my depression. I could have just earned more rewards and enjoy all these rewards in eternity. And you'll regret that, that decision for all of eternity. So don't be stupid. See, King David didn't commit suicide, did he? No. God still used him. He still wrote Psalms. I mean, he still um, ro uh, raised up, he still uh, raised up Solomon, in whose time there was peace and prosperity in all of Israel. He still was a Okay, he, he had serious consequences, but he still, he still tried his best and he did accomplish something. Hey, if you're not a reprobate, and if you did sins that are worthy of death, and the German government doesn't put you to death, that doesn't mean that you should commit suicide. God can still use you. Yeah? Now, before I get to the next argument, I just want to give a bonus point. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15 and while you're turning there I'll, I'll read from John chapter 18 then said Pilate unto them take ye him and judge him according to your law the Jews therefore said unto him it is not lawful for us to put any man to death okay see Jews uh, they, they couldn't kill Jesus because according to Rome they couldn't, kill, they couldn't take the death penalty upon their hands. The Roman government stripped them of some of their rights. Now the question is, if you, if you turn to Matthew, if you're there in Matthew chapter 15, to, uh, turn to verse 4, I will read from verse 4. For God commanded saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Yeah? I mean... I mean, if you, if you read, okay, I'll read from uh, verse 1. Then came uh, to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Now, some of them look at this argument and says, Well, Jesus should be aware that they couldn't put any person to death because they are under Roman siege. So why is he telling them, hey, you guys are not putting uh, 
people to cur uh, curse their father and mother to death. Doesn't Jesus know that? The thing is, the very reason why Rome has conquered them is because even before Rome has conquered them, they forgot the laws of God. The very reason why they're in that phase there is because they, they, they just rejected God. I mean, we see that pattern being played out in the whole of Old Testament. Whenever they rejected God, God brought forth another foreign nation to judge them. Yeah, we saw them with Babylon, with Assyria, with Persia. And it's not a surprise that they are under the Roman siege. Why? Because it's very obvious that these guys are reprobates. They've rejected God. If they had been following God's laws, if they were uh, loving God, they wouldn't be in this position in the first place. Yeah? See, and of course, if you read the book of Daniel, Rome is the final, it's the iron, uh, it's like emperor with the iron fist that would basically destroy Israel once for all. You know, the Old Testament Israel was destroyed by Rome. God used Rome to destroy them completely. They don't exist anymore. What we see today is a fake. Yeah. <clears throat> now, this is one question that bothered me, okay? Rome took away their rights so they couldn't kill anybody. But why was the, how, how, under what authority did they put Stephen to death? Later, they dragged Stephen out and they stoned him to death. Did they go to the Rome? Did they go to the Roman governor to get the permission? So why did they, why did they went to Rome to get uh, Jesus killed? <clears throat> See, uh, I'll read from Matthew chapter 26. Turn to Matthew 26. Just a couple of chapters ahead. Matthew 26. I will read from verses 1. Matthew chapter 26. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes, and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and consulted, look at verse 4, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. Okay, but they said, not on the feast day, let there be an uproar among the people. They wanted to basically nab Jesus in stealth, secretly, and just kill him. That was their original plan. They didn't plan on going to Rome and creating the conspiracy and putting him to death. See, the thing is, in order for these people to put someone to death, to murder someone, they didn't need the consent of Rome. See, even when Jesus started his ministry, when he was preaching in the synagogue, the people dragged him out. They wanted to throw him off a cliff. They were prepared to do that. They didn't need a Roman, uh, this thing or whatever. See, if they wanted to kill Jesus, they could have done it without approaching Rome. Okay, but the thing is, at this point, Jesus has become so popular that they were afraid of the crowds. They couldn't nab Jesus and stone him to death for it because there was so much of crowd behind Jesus. And Pharisees are just few people, yeah? And so they had to come up with this conspiracy to buy Judas out and have him betray him, capture him, create a false testimony, take him to Pilate. Why? Because if Rome were to do that work, the crowd wouldn't be a problem. The crowd wouldn't dare come against Rome. Yeah, And also one thing is Jesus constantly, he put these Pharisees to shame in the public. Constantly. He was exposing them day after day, day after day. And these guys' anger just came. So they weren't probably satisfied. I mean, for example, when they when Judas, they sent Judas to kiss Jesus and betray him. And they also sent soldiers. I mean, they could have just taken Jesus aside and stabbed him to death, finished. But no, they, that wouldn't have been enough for them. They wanted to make a public embarrassment of Jesus. They wanted to put him to shame in public because their anger was... Yeah. <clears throat> John 8, 44, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. But there is no truth in him. Constantly we see Jesus telling Pharisees, you guys are murder, murderers. You kill the prophets. These guys are murderers. They don't care about death penalty. They don't care about Rome taking away their rights. If they want to kill Jesus, they could have killed Jesus. Yeah. 
Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, quickly, let's turn there. Let's look at one more verse where Jesus is supporting the death penalty. Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. We all know this verse. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Oh, Jesus is not so loving. He is not talking like Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> That's what people would do. Say, he, is it, does this show a loving God here? Yes. To, to the children, yeah. But towards the reprobates, is he loving? Absolutely not. <clears throat> argument number four. This is an argument that's the most common. Everybody knows this, yeah. He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Whenever you say, hey, almost deserve to be put to death, adulterers should be put to death. Hey, Jesus said, he that is without sin, let him first cast a stone at her. Sorry, let him for yeah. Turn to John chapter 8. Turn to John chapter. Let's look at that. Let's look at what Jesus is actually saying, what's actually happening there. A lot of people don't understand this chapter. In fact, the modern versions, they, this entire segment, they put a footnote and said this does not exist in the earlier manuscripts. Yeah. And the thing is, they will still leave this. They will still leave this passage because if you just take it out, people will freak out. Nobody will buy their Bibles because this is a very famous story. Every person knows that this story indeed happened. Okay, nobody doubts this. But let me tell you this. Even if the story is there, they removed some parts of the verses. And let me show you. I'll read from verses 1, John chapter 8. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives and early in the morning he came again to the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought, him, brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground. And that's where the verse ends in all the modern Bibles. But there's a little bit of information it says, as though he heard them not. As though he heard them not. Now, this has given liberty for many preachers to say that Jesus got down and wrote all their sins. You heard that argument? Yeah. He got down and he started writing all their sins on the ground. I'll, I'll, I'll explain why that's so stupid. But this is very, see, sometimes when I'm just on the table alone, when somebody's telling me things that are like offending me, you know, I just... As if I'm not hearing them, I make circles with my hand, drawing things on the table on my... That's what Jesus was doing, okay? He was just making, you know, some meaningless pictures probably. I saw this one Jesus movie where he gets on the ground and he draws a fish. I'm like, what? <laughs> what does that have to do with anything, yeah? Verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience. This part is taken away from modern Bibles. Being convicted by their own conscience. Went out one by one, beginning at eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, the woman standing in the midst. So if you read the modern Bibles, this is how it goes. Verse 9. And they which heard it, Went out one by one, beginning at the elders, even unto the, the part being convicted by their own conscience is missing. Let me explain that, yeah? But let's finish uh, verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none that but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those then accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Okay? Go back to verse 9 here. It says, being convicted by their own conscience. See, when Jesus said, him that is without, he that is without uh, sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. What, what happened? They felt guilty. They felt guilty. Something happened in them. They were like, oh. <sighs> now, why did they feel guilty? See, when Jesus, uh, God instituted the death penalty in the Old Testament, right? He instituted the death penalty. He said, if you commit adultery, bam. You know, people should stone you to death. Yeah? And let's say, I mean, the Old Testament, who wrote the Old Testament? Jesus. It's the word of God. 
Yeah. So does it make sense to say, okay, God said, okay, if you commit adultery, put this person to death. But then Jesus is like, hey, let him uh, who is without sin, let him first cast a stone at her. Is God like contradicting himself? But that's what a lot of people think. You know, God is like, he's saying this, but then Jesus is like stopping that and saying, no, 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 no. If only if you're without sin, then you're allowed to kill that person. So that's an argument that they use and say, sorry, no death penalty. We are all with sin. We all have sin. So we don't have the authority to put anyone to death. But wait a minute. In the Old Testament, when people convicted somebody of adultery and they were putting her to death, were they without sin? There's, everybody's with sin, right? So this shows that Jesus wasn't talking about sin in general. He's not saying, okay, if, you're, if you don't have any sin, then it's, not, it's talking about a very specific sin here. They're guilty of something that doesn't give them the right to kill her, kind of. And the thing is, it's hypocrisy. If you see the sin that Jesus is constantly bringing out among the Pharisees, it's a sin of hypocrisy. Yeah, these guys didn't have any respect for God's law. They didn't come with the righteous intent. They came there to bait Jesus, to corner Jesus, to accuse him. And Jesus is saying, okay, yeah, you think you guys are so righteous? Okay. If you don't have any sin, the first person was not, no, cast the stone. No, Jesus is not like revealing some new information there and saying, oh, and these guys are like, oh, we didn't know that we had sin in our lives. Yeah, we are also sinners. It's not what it is. Yeah. He's not coming up with a new doctrine. I mean, it's, uh, you know, Jesus wasn't referring to all sins. You might be asking, okay, how do you know that? He doesn't say the specific sin. Well, look at verse 11. She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus saith unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Is he telling her, just don't be a sinner in general? He's being, a very, he's being very specific. He's saying, don't continue in this sin. Get right with the Lord. Don't continue in adultery. I mean, if Jesus is saying you need to get out of your sin, you need to stop sinning. I mean, that's like impossible. Yeah. In the same way, he's saying uh, in verse uh, seven, he's saying, OK, if you if you're, think you're righteous, if you're having a righteous view towards God's law, go ahead and stone her. And but that was not the case. See, of course, Jesus is not condemning her. And of course, Jesus couldn't have taken a stone and killed her because that would bring him in problem with the Rome with the Roman government. He doesn't have the authority in his physical um, um, state to condemn her to death. Yeah, it's the, it's the Rome's job. And Jesus not condemning her pictures salvation there. Yeah. And the argument number five, quickly close uh, after this. Argument number five. I mean, uh, I mean, it's pretty clear here. Death penalty is not aufgehoben, it's not eradicated because of this verse it's a false understanding and just because these verses are removed people uh, come up with wrong doctrines for example in the previous one jesus was writing they all their sins on the ground that doesn't make any sense I mean, are you are you saying that uh, uh, now, now jesus is like saying okay only if you're not a uh, sinner then you can kill somebody then, then God is, then he's contradicting what God said in the Old Testament, if that's the case. If Jesus was writing all their sins on the ground. Argument number five, that is the last argument. An eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Who said that? Jesus. No. Gandhi. Uh, <laughs> Gandhi said an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Okay. Now. Turn to Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus chapter 24. I will, while you're turning there, I'll read from Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. Oh, sorry, uh, Matthew chapter 5. Now Jesus is saying, Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. So people don't understand this term eye for eye and tooth for tooth. Okay, so uh, you're there in Leviticus chapter 24. Let's read from verse 19. Leviticus 24, let me turn there myself. Verse 19. 
And if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor as he hath done so, so shall it be done to him. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he hath caused a blemish in a man, so it shall be done to him again. Verse 21, And he that killeth a beast, he shall restore it. And he that killeth a man, he shall be put to death. Now, a lot of people look at this and say, okay, death penalty is understandable, right? I mean, if you put someone to death, if you take somebody's life, life is required of you. You should be put to death by man. What does eye for eye and tooth for tooth mean? Does it mean that if, let's say, I get into a fight with brother Anthony and I poke one of his eye out, or let's say I, I break one of his teeth, then according to the law, I should take a dentist appointment and he should take my teeth out and then, hey, na 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 na, he lost a tooth, you lost a tooth, even even. That doesn't make sense. Well, look at this word, it says breach for breach. For example, if you, if you kill someone's animal, okay, if you have a sheep, and if I kill that sheep, I have to give you a sheep, I have to replace it, okay? It's restitution. Now turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 19. I will explain it further. Deuteronomy chapter 19. <clears throat> now before I uh, explain this, let me say this. I'll, I'll just explain this. This is very clear what, what this means. Let's say... Let's say me and brother Anthony, we got into a fight, yeah? And I beat him so hard, he fell down a staircase and he broke his back, yeah? Or let's say I punched him so hard in the high that he, he lost his eyesight, he cannot see anymore. You know, according to the law, I need to make restitution. I need to be the eye for the eye that I have damaged. See, because he's blind now, he cannot earn money. He cannot take care of his family. I need to fulfill that purpose. That's what that means. I need to be the eye for the eye of damaged. I need to make the restitution. I need to make the breach for breach. That does not mean that my eyes also should be plugged out. Okay? Maybe, maybe if I say, no, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not, I'm not going to pay him. Then maybe I think according to the law, my eyes should be taken out. I'm not sure. But uh, let's see. Deuteronomy chapter 19. I will read from verse 16. Deuteronomy 19 verse 16 If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong Then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord before the priests and the judges Which shall be in those days and the judges shall make diligent inquisition and behold if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother Then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother so shall thou put evil from among you And those which remain shall hear and fear, and um, uh, hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. Look at verse 21. And then I shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. If you give false witness against someone, and if they be put to death, you should be put to death. And let's say they're given 40 beatings. And if they found out that you actually said uh, made a false witness, then you will receive 40 beatings. Yeah. Let's say if as a, as a punishment, as a result of you giving a false witness, this person had to pay some amount of money. Let's say he had to pay 10,000 euros. Then once it has been proven that he is not guilty, you have to make that restitution. You have to pay him 10,000 euros. That is the picture doesn't mean that your tooth should be taken out, your leg should be taken out, your hand, fingers should be taken out. That's not Islam, right? And Gandhi misunderstood this verse. He thought, because the Pharisees were using this verse to preach revenge. They were saying, uh, you are allowed to take revenge. If somebody does this, do the same unto him. And that's revenge. That's not what Jesus is saying here. And that's what Gandhi understood. And he came up with this bizarre quote. And he said, oh, if your eye for an eye is revenge, and if you start taking revenge, it will make the whole world blind. That is stupid. They didn't understand God's law. People who come, uh, comment on this. That is not the right way. Restitution, man. If I damage something, if I get into a fight and I damage some of your property, I need to make restitution. Isn't that, uh, aren't, aren't laws, uh, don't laws promote that even today? Yeah, why is it such a radical thing then? God is just making a picture here. He's making symbolism. He's using these words. 
So we saw five arguments and we disproved them all from the Bible. Yeah, thou shalt not kill. The second argument was, uh, sorry, the death of Jesus abol abolished death penalty. That's not the case. You know, the death of Jesus, of course, uh, frees us from, it delivers us from hell. It gives us salvation. It does not take away the civic death penalty. And number three, they say looking at a woman lustfully is adultery. Therefore, we all deserve to die. That's not what Jesus is saying. Yeah, they say uh, King David was not put to death because the death penalty was lifted up. But we know that he, he, God did not want a king. He was above the law. Yeah. And then they said, let him, who is, uh, who is without sin among you, let him first, uh, first cast a stone at her. And we've seen that Jesus is not taking away the death penalty from there. Yeah. He's basically exposing them. An eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. We're not talking about revenge there. See, today, if, if, some, if, if you're in a government where somebody caused you damage and they're not paying you the restitution and Jesus is saying you need to forgive them, yeah? what can you do? If, if the government doesn't support you and if your own brother has done, uh, done some damage and Jesus says to turn your left cheek, just bear it, you know, be, be brotherly. Yeah? <clears throat> Why preach this sermon? I'll end with this. Why preach this sermon? I've got a list of points. Number one, don't tempt yourself to commit sins which God has ordained the death penalty for. If you're married, don't contemplate adultery. You'll have serious consequences. See, there are so many innocent churchgoers who are being deceived by false teachers today. Yeah? There are so many false teachers who twist, who use these arguments and say we shouldn't stand for the death penalty. We should voice out against the death penalty. So many innocent churchgoers. They say, oh, and you know, I, even, even I know there will be a lot of Christians who listen to this sermon and they'll say, well, we should focus on the love of Jesus. We should focus on the gospel. You know, Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to save it, you know. They're just people pleasers. They just don't want to get into trouble. They don't want to lose friends over this. Yeah. Instead of preaching God's word with authority, they subscribe to the world's narrative. See, if you get your brain washed with Hollywood, this is all the crap that you come up with. No death penalty. If you are following Batman, Superman, so all these superhero movies, that's, that's the narrative that you get. Oh, nobody deserves the death penalty. Everybody deserves a second chance. No killing, no. Of course, you shouldn't take the law into your own hands though. Yeah, of course not. And another important is don't buy and meditate upon false Bible versions. We've clearly seen in John chapter eight, how verses are removed and why people get a false understanding of the scriptures. And very important, preaching death penalty upon evildoers will get people saved. Especially when you go out soul winning. Let me explain that. We got an email recently about one guy who said, I'll just read the message. He said, I wanted to say thank you for your work, he wrote to Brother Anselm. I hate all this sodomite scum. I was a victim of sexual abuse by a gay doctor when I was a teenager. A trauma that I could not get over for a long time. My story is too long to tell here. It was not until 2020 after years of being an embittered atheist that I found Jesus and became a Baptist and found meaning in life. But the wounds of abuse in me are deep and the sodomites are persistently, persistently working to destroy more lives and identities. There are Christians out there, sorry, there are people out there who are tired, who are sick of Christians saying that homos, should, we should love homos, accept them. And that's a stumbling block for these people to get saved. When you actually preach the word of God, people will see you, you're telling the truth. Yes, you're absolutely right. Then they'll listen to you. They'll take you seriously. They will listen to the Bible way to heaven. They'll get saved because you have the courage to speak the truth. And uh, don't compromise on what the Bible teaches on reprobate doctrine. When I go out on soul winning, sometimes people ask me, um, do you believe homos should be put to death? Or do you believe homosexuality is a sin? And I say, that's what the Bible says. And I always give this example. I say, um, see, when God, there was a time in history when God uh, called out a nation and he gave them laws. And he said, if you follow them, you will be prosperous. And if you don't follow them, you will be destroyed. You will go down the drain. And if you see today, most of the Western countries, the USA, Germany, they have rejected God's laws 
and you can see that they're going morally down the drain. And even sodomite supporters, even the fag hags, they will agree with you. <laughs> they say, yeah, our cultures are going down the drain. Now, why do you think? Surprise, eh? Yeah. <clears throat> and finally, this is my final point. When we come back, after we get raptured, when you come back with Jesus, with our resurrected bodies, we're going to have a lot of responsibility in this world. Yes? We're going to be judges. That's what the Bible says. We will be judging angels. We'll be, have, we'll be ruler over cities. Some people get four cities. Some people get ten cities to rule over. Yeah? And you know what? It, we are going to be having to make some serious decisions. Especially, we're going to be passing out so many death sentences to so many evildoers when we are judges. That is the work that God will entrust to. That is the honor that God is going to give us. Do you think God is going to give you that honor if you stand against death penalty today? If you go against Christians, if you talk against Christians who are standing on God's word, do you think God is going to honor you with any rewards in eternity? Do you think he's going to, okay, you stood your whole life against death penalty. Now, okay, you make death penalty decisions. Jesus, do you think God's going to do that? No way. No way. You, you're going to be sweeping floors, opening doors for people to walk in, walk out in his kingdom. For example, this guy, this bozo, internet bozo came up with the video, right? Oh, you guys are homophobic, that and this and this and that. Do you think God is going to give him any responsibility, any honor? First of all, I don't believe he's saved. Let's say it's slightest chance he is. He's going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. He's going to be least. Now you might be saying, Moses, uh, your rewards in heaven depends on your soul winning. It does not depend on what view you have towards death penalty. But it's funny, you know, people who do real soul winning, they have the doctrine right on death penalty. People who stand against death penalty, they're obviously never soul winning. You don't see them as soul winners. Yeah, get your doctrines right. Let's, let's stand for God's word because that's what matters in eternity. That we need to be right judges. And we need, in, a, in order to be trustworthy judges in his kingdom, you need to get a correct understanding of God's word today and preach it with all boldness. Yes? Let's pray. Let's bow down and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you Lord for this preaching time. Thank you for talking to us through your word. Lord, thank you Lord that you have given these laws which are so clear. You haven't left your people in confusion, in wondering what we must do, what and this, but you made every detail so clear. So we don't have to be in confusion. And Lord, even as we progress, as we move forward, as soul winners, as even as we establish church, help us to preach, help us to stand by your word and preach with all boldness and diligence without making compromises. Help us to preach hard, help us to take a firm stand. And also pray, Lord, for so many brainwashed Christians out there, saved people who are being sucked into these false teachings to reject your word, to stand against your word. Lord, that you deliver them, that you open their eyes, you expose them to the right preaching. Lord, and that you continue to use us for the extension of your kingdom and also and we go out soul winning, O oh Lord, when people ask these questions, help us to be in the situation to answer them gently and not at the same time compromising. In Jesus' name, I offer this prayer. Amen. Amen.